Well, hi, everyone. Here we are for part two, dealing with this new book that Dr. Jeanson has written called Traced. It's quite a, quite a work, really, and tremendous uh, charts and diagrams inside. In fact, there's a whole, whole section inside of charts and, and diagrams here that um, we'll talk about as we go on here. But it's called Traced, Human a Human's DNA's Big Surprise. And last week, we actually had the big reveal about my uh, DNA test, the uh, Y chromosome test that said I belong to R1B going back primarily to Shem. I was surprised. I thought it'd be Japheth, but apparently, apparently mainly Shem. Is that right, Dr. Jensen? That's right. And, and now you're going to maybe mention that again. And your own, actually, your own ancestry is the same sort of thing as mine. And uh, so we're closer cousins than we thought we were. Uh, and going back to Shem. And today we're going to talk about Western Europeans. And you're, you're going to explain how. And just to give everyone a little overview again, uh, what you've done is look at Y chromosome data from around the world. And you understand the mutation rate. And so you look for similarities and differences and have a program that does all this. And you're able to, if you use the biblical time frame, which makes sense because the mutation rate does not make sense with an evolutionary time frame, doesn't fit. The actual science confirms a short time frame for history, which means confirms a biblical history time frame. And when you use that biblical time frame, you can actually understand uh, the history of civilizations, you can see certain events, migration patterns, certain uh, events like population decline or other events in history. And it's absolutely fascinating. So we're going to go through a series of those over the next uh, four weeks. And so today it's going to be Western Europeans. And then we're going to look at the history of Native Americans. That'll be next week. That'll be very interesting. Uh, you've got some fascinating insights about those. Then we'll talk about uh, race and ethnicity and some well, shocking discoveries. That's going to be interesting. People will probably be absolutely shocked when they hear about uh, some of their ancestry there. And then we'll talk about uh, missions as well and uh, scientific arguments for recent history and so on. So that's what we're doing. And again, it's really dealing with uh, the content of the book Traced. And you're going to show some slides. You'll do most of the talking and I'll just Jump in now and then. So, Dr. Jensen, over to you to talk more about Western Europeans and a little bit more about you and I and our ancestry. And I'd say part of the purpose of, of this series, from my perspective, is to give people a sneak preview of the book if they've watched the video series we did two years ago, and even if they're just new to this, to give them a sense for just how big of a deal this publication is, not because what I'm doing is anything yet, that I'm a big deal, but the 4,500 year time scale is a big deal. And I'm gonna really talk about this more heavily, probably in our last episode, that the, the state of affairs in the creation evolution debate is seeing a dramatic role reversal. Creationists have been playing defense for a long time and now we're playing offense and making major scientific discoveries. And the, the big theme I have for this series is is the, the volumes, not just new chapters, but new volumes of our past that this sort of research is contributing. And we had discussed some of this in our time together last week, how we can find Noah at the base of this Y chromosome tree, the, the male inherited DNA, how we can trace every single person's ancestry back to specific men in Genesis 10. We'll talk about ha what happened after Babel. So my line, Ken's line, R1B, goes back to a specific son of Joktan, a, a, a descendant of Shem. And we'll see what, where they went and, and all the various places they went and how they multiplied in the years following. But that's, that's one major discovery that we hadn't had before that is a huge confirmation of the biblical anthropology. What we briefly alluded to and that the book spends a, a, a good chunk on, we just briefly alluded to it last week, is that you can also see the genealogical line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the 12 tribes. Well, we can see maybe one or two of the tribes and there's likely more genealogical genetic echo of those 12 tribes. But this, this is a really big deal. And you can think of this as relevant far beyond just the, the Christian community 
the Jewish community will be interested in this. I've had Muslims contact me because just out of the blue saying, we'd like to know if we're descended from Ishmael. This, this has massive global relevance. And the, the third major volume of discovery that, that this sort of research uncovers is related to each one of us individually. And it's, it's not just men, even though this is the male inherited DNA and this, this DNA changes from generation to generation. Men and women have the same challenge in a sense, trying to uncover their ancestry because my own personal history is half my dad, half my mom. And my dad's personal history is half his mom and half his dad. And so all of us have to figure out what do we do with the female side of our various branches. You take your own Y chromosome test if you're a male, that's just one small sliver of your story. And you'll have to get your mother's relative and your dad's mother's relative and, and these sorts of connections to uncover the full scope of your complex, glorious family history. And perhaps some things you may not wanna know. There's, uh, there's aspects of my own family history that perhaps we didn't know or didn't wanna know and, and, and DNA records all that. So sins and such, it's all there. I want to connect what we're doing, though, to a book I wrote five years ago, four and a half years ago, replacing Darwin, October 2017. And back then, advanced the audacious thesis that creationists are not just rebutting Darwin, but replacing him with better scientific ideas. We saw, a, and, and, the, and the focus of this book, I should say, was on the wider question of the origin of species. And we had a fulfillment of some of these claims just a few months later the icon of evolution, Darwin's finches, formed a new species in a manner and at a rate that exactly matched what I put in the book. So we had fulfilled testable predictions. Those are these, these articles on our website, replacing, uh, excuse me, replacing Darwin is the book. You can get that on our website too. But the article talking about this fulfilled prediction, just type in bombshell to our search engine on ancestorsgenesis.org. You'll be able to come up with two of these articles. The second article is a second bombshell for replacing Darwin. Why this is relevant to what we're doing now is one of the specific predictions that I made in replacing Darwin relates to human history. I said that we should be able to see, as we've mentioned today and also last week, we should be able to see the echo of civilization in our DNA if our history is just a few thousand years old. The derivation of that is a little bit more complex, but that's, that's one of the, the major aspects of this. And right now the fact that we have this new book traced out the fact that we're having these lectures that i can talk about this is all reflective of the fact that we've reached a major milestone creationists are now making major scientific discoveries and earlier on in this research process there was a pastor who was dialoguing with me who i think was a little bit on the fence as it relates to the age of the earth and such and the fact that or i should say when he found out when it finally hit him Oh, this isn't, this isn't just anti-evolution, oh, you're wrong, but creationists are moving forward and advancing the ball, so to speak, scientifically and, and uncovering new things, new aspects of the world that we, we had forgotten or lost. Today, that's when the light bulb went on for him and, and he was really excited about all this. And so the volume I want to discuss today that, that bridges what we discussed last week and also relates to one of the main thrusts of the book is a question that had long bothered me, having taken world history class in high school, the problem that bothered me was the, what, what was left out of the history curriculum. We talked about the political empires. We talked about Rome being founded, let's say, in the 700s BC and then being overthrown, at least the Western half being overthrown by the barbarians in the 400s AD. And the story has a clear start and a clear stop, which is how political kingdoms often go. But missing from all this was the story of the people of the Roman Empire. Who did the Romans come from? So put the flood at 2,500 years ago, roughly. You've got approximately 2,000 years of history that transpire before Rome, quote unquote, has its beginning. So what were the Romans doing for 2,000 years? Who, who did they come from? What relationships do they have to the other peoples of the globe? That was a big black box. And then the second the, or the, the other side of that narrative, what happens to the people after the civilization collapses, they get overthrown, was also unanswered. Or to make it personal, especially for some viewers who may be watching of a Italian descent or of Italian American descent, is it legitimate to claim the Romans as genealogical ancestors if you can claim Italian descent? These are questions that the history class never covered. These are the questions now that this new research finally reveals the answers to. And this is this is a major scientific discovery. 
And the key, of course, to all this, as we, we referenced earlier, is this Y chromosome tree, the DNA based generation by generation family tree for global humanity. This particular tree, we had it behind us on a, uh, a big board in the last episode. This, here it's again on the slide. And you'll see this in the book and in great detail as we look at individual branches and you can, you can pick up the, the individual names and such. You won't be able to see it at this level of resolution, but it's all there in the book. It's again from men from around the globe, North America, South America, Middle East, Africa, Europe, East Asia, Pacific, good representative swath of the globe. And then the book itself draws on all sorts of studies. So we've got, we've got data from thousands upon thousands of men, all these various pieces of the human origins and human history puzzle that come together. These labels, I want to explain briefly now. I didn't explain that as much in the, in the first episode. These labels are somewhat arbitrary designations just for major branches. I've used these color codes consistently throughout the book just to make it easier to remember, easier to follow. So when I'm talking about, for example, E1B1B, what does that mean? It's just, it's just Greek. I'm always using this tan color when I show the maps of where these people are, use that tan color. It's, it's all designed to help the reader follow all of these various narratives. What I wanna focus though on now is a branch that is in among modern Italians. So I began with the question of what happened to the ancient Romans. If you look at modern Italians, they belong to various of these branches. And, and just to finish what I'd started, the, the deepest branches are assigned arbitrary letters of the alphabet. Like in pink here, there's Q. Well, Q is a relative of R. R further subdivides into R2 and R1. And so, you know, if it subdivides, you get a number and then you get a letter and then a letter and a number. And on and on it goes, R1 divides into R1A, R1B, and R1B happens to be the branch to which the Jensen family line and the Ham family line both belong. It's also, among a modern Italian men, the branch at its highest levels in modern Italians. So if you look at all modern Italian men or you get a sample of them and you, you see which branches they belong to, there's a whole bunch of them so modern Italians are a diverse people. They contain a mix of lineages and around 30% of them belong to R1B. And that's, that's the highest percentage you can find. So 70% belong to other branches, but they're all distributed among various subgroups. So that, that's itself an indication how mixed everyone's history is. Italians are representative in that sense. They're like so many other people groups that have a whole diversity of lineages contributing to them. I'm gonna zoom in on this particular branch so we can see some of the details here in a moment. And the main thing I want you to see, and I'm just gonna give you again, this, this little episode will give you just a snippet of one of the chapters in this book, Traced. There's a lot of detail in this slide. You don't have to be able to read all these various names. You'll be able to see them in the book if you're, if you're curious. The main thing I want you to see though is that there's a, there's a stepwise, a step-like pattern here in this branching structure, time moves from left to right. We can assign dates to these various branches. And I should stop here and say, these dates are based on the 4,500 year time scale. You get very different dates if you try to reinterpret this entire tree within an evolutionary time scale. All this history evaporates when you try to restructure it from the mainstream within a mainstream view. So just be aware of that. And, and what you'll see then as we go along is, recorded history jumps out from the tree when you have this 4,500 year time scale. So back here, this particular branch happens to lead to the Uyghurs in Northwest China, originated around the 65 BC to 8400s. There's always a range of dates for a variety of reasons, one of which is this inherent statistical uncertainty in doing a genetic analysis. You've got this branch around the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. Here's one in the Middle Ages. Here's a later one, 1100s to 1500s BC. That's sort of the later Middle Ages. What I'm gonna do in the next few slides is map out for you these types of data, not just from this particular tree that I've shown on the screen here, but from a whole collection of studies or a whole collection of men from around Europe. And I'm gonna plot for you where you can find these various branches today. And a, and a very intriguing pattern emerges. So I'll say, we'll say, uh, Take a look at this branch right here from that, that originated and, and separated from the main trunk of R1B in the six, you know, around the time of Christ, 65 BC to 8400s. So we'll we'll plot on a map where all these men belong today, where, where they're found today. And then we'll plot off, we'll plot some of these branches. Anyway, that's that's the idea of where we're going with this particular example. And this will reveal for us again then 
the deeper history of where my line, where Ken Ham's line comes from, where much of the Western European line comes from. And we'll see if this, this has anything to do with ancient Rome. Does this tell us the fate of the ancient Romans? It comes from Shem, but could we find some link to the, the builders of this once great civilization? Some of the earliest branches in R1B are found nowhere close to Rome. This particular branch here, and, and I've got these color coded for the, for the sub branches. Again, all these will be R1B and they'll have dash M73. And unfortunately there isn't a great system for labeling these labels after the branch. These are, this is what you might find in the DNA test. Again, arbitrary labels for a particular DNA letter. It, it's, just, it's just what's used in the literature, and I apologize in advance. But that's what it is. It happens to be a, a branch that originates, breaks off the main trunk around the 400s to 700s AD, basically the Dark Ages. Nowhere close to Rome. It's out here close to Kazakhstan. This is Russia right here. Here's the Caucasus. I should mention as well, when you see these circles... The size of the circle is a marker of the relative abundance of this particular branch in a people group. So out here, this group of Russians near Kazakhstan, this is a larger circle here than there. So this might be, let's say, 1% of the people in the Caucasus. This branch up here, or excuse me, this population up here, maybe it's 5 to 10%. What I also want you to see is that there's none of this branch out here in most of the rest of Europe. R1B at this point in history looks like it was probably out there. That's where their descendants ended up staying. And there's other reasons that I go for that conclusion, that I give for that conclusion in the book. If you look at a later, later branch, so this is happens to be called M269. It's the orange one. It's AD 700s to 1400s is when it breaks away from the main trunk. Now we're moving closer to modern Europe. They're over here in, in Western Russia, Eastern Europe. You can find some of it down here in Turkey. The Balkans, Italy, again, if you look at Germany, France, Spain, the UK, Ken's family line would be British in origin. Jeanson would be French. You don't see it even at, at this later stage of history in Europe. There's no modern descendants of this branch in Europe, in the, in, the, in the westernmost parts of Europe. And of course, if you're watching this from the United States, just think, of, think back to where your family line would have come from in Europe if you're Caucasian American. Another branch called L23, and again, the, the specific labels don't really matter. It's just what's been used in the literature. Again, the, there's circles here in Eastern Europe, not so much in Western Europe, a very tiny one here in Ireland, a tiny one here in France. This is, this is not terribly abundant. Then something happens. This is a key change in the history of R1B. So here I've said they, they break away in the 700s to 1400s AD, in the late 1400s to early 1500s, you'll notice in the next slide, there isn't much in the Balkans or in Turkey, but now it starts to move into Western Europe. So notice again the dates, 700s to 1400s for this branch, the locations, where it is and where it's not. Yes, in the Balkans, Southeastern Europe, Turkey, not so much in Western Europe. Almost a, a reversal of that. Nothing in Turkey, nothing in the Balkans, but now it's here in high levels in Holland, Germany, Austria. You can see it moving into the UK. It's sort of a central European branch, and the dates are fairly late in history, 1450s to 1510. Something apparently happened, perhaps, in the Balkans that sent these guys packing in another direction. Here's the specific sub-branch to which I belong, S116. High levels in France, Spain, Portugal. Not over here in the Balkans or in Turkey. The U152, a sub-branch of S116, does spill over back into the Balkans through Italy and, and Switzerland and such. The branch that's likely the one to which the ham line belongs, which is much more heavily in, in, in UK and Ireland, is the M529, sub-branch of M529. This could be the ham line as well, is M222. If you were to combine all these data, and again, these are, these are maps you will find in the book, taken straight from the book, you can basically plot out what looks like a migration path. This is just reading the genetic data off the tree, plotting it on a map, this is what seems to emerge. They're migrating into Europe from Central Asia during the Middle Ages. You see them down in the Balkans, not so much in Western Europe. They end up apparently fleeing because there's a very short window of time in which these guys start distributing and splitting apart. They seem to do this right around the late 1400s, 1500s. I go through some more of this in the book. It, that, that's exactly the time when the Ottoman Empire starts laying waste. The last great push into Europe lays waste to Hungary. 
that would seem like a plausible cause effect scenario. The people who once were here that perhaps were fighting off the Ottomans as they start advancing further into Europe, just go fleeing and apparently have all sorts of children, all sorts of offspring. Again, if you watch the episode from last week, an analogous situation would be the current state of Europe where there's a lot of Middle Eastern refugees coming, fleeing Syria and such, and they tend to be Muslim, they tend to have more children, and it could be just a few generations before much of Europe can claim Middle Eastern descent because of all the children that were born and who subsequently have many more children in Europe. If you look at R1B as a whole, so that was the subgroups within R1B, you can see now today, the largest circles are out here in Western Europe, 74% of the UK, 50, 60% of France, big chunk of Spain and such, lots of R1B there. And what we've just seen is it didn't originate in, it doesn't seem to have originated in Europe. It wasn't in Europe around the time of the Roman Empire. So what happened to the ancient Romans? I talk about that in a subsequent chapter, but most of Western Europe, much of Eastern Europe, just to finish this part of the story, to round out the full story of modern Europe and its Central Asian origins, R1A is a sister branch to R1B. We've had friends stay with us who happen to belong to this branch as well. You can see where the big circles in Western Europe are R1B. In R1A, the circles are much bigger in Eastern Europe, almost mirror image, and they may have been part of the same event. Now, thinking to my story, Ken's story, the story of much of Europe as a whole, Western in particular, and also you can see here Eastern, there's a, there's a very intriguing known historical event in the Middle Ages that has a very similar direction to what I've just shown. And I'll show it in this map right here. It's the migration of peoples like the Magyars and the Turkic peoples like the Pechenegs, Oguz, and Kipchak. Now, none of these might be familiar to you if you grew up like I did. So let me explain them. The Magyars are who the modern Hungarians would claim as their ancestors. They would say, our ancestors lived out here in near the Ural Mountains, perhaps, closer to Central Asia. This is the Black Sea here, the Caspian Sea, the, the Stans of the former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and such would be out here. Up here would be part of Russia. The Hungarians today would say, our ancestors were somewhere out here and migrated in in the 800s, 900s AD, and that's where we come from, a late arrival into Europe. These other colored branches, green and blue and yellow and such, these are all Turkic people. So you, if you think Turkic, you might think of modern Turkey, which is down here. It was news to me. Maybe I forgot from world history or maybe we just didn't learn this much. They weren't originally in the land of Anatolia. They were once out here in Central Asia and around 1000 AD, just 1000 years ago, migrated down through the Middle East and came up here into modern Turkey. So the Turkic origins tend to be out here in Central Asia. And there were a number of other Turkic peoples migrating into Eastern Europe at exactly the time we saw this with R1B. R1B appears to record the precise temporal echo and, and direction of these migrations. You see this history echoed in DNA and, and you see it only because you have the Young Earth timescale. You wouldn't see any of this sort of correlation. If you use the evolutionary timescale, they would stretch out the timeline for the genetic history and, and it would say R1B originated 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, it's something much older. So let's think of the implications of this. Most Europeans or people of European descent, like myself and, and, and Ken and his family, would trace their ancestry to Europe. But more, more uh, going back a little bit further, if you look genetically to Central Asia, that's not something I ever would have predicted. I mean, you look at me, you look at Ken, we don't look like Far East Asians. If you look at people in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan today, they look much more like the Chinese than they do your average German or, or British gentleman or, or, or Frenchman. But this is what genetic reveals, genetics reveals. So in a sense, you could say if you're, if you're in America, you're a Caucasian American, you're really an Asian European. These are the sorts of unexpected scenarios and unexpected histories that this sort of investigation reveals. Now, just briefly, just for sake of time, I'll tell you, if you do read chapters, chapter eight, I think, where I talk about the origin of the Persians and the origin of the, the Indo-European peoples, those do seem to come from Japheth. They're a minority in Europe right now. The European branch is this group I. You can see it there. Again, it's, it's, it's not the majority. It's the Central Asians who came in recently, who apparently multiplied more than the indigenous Europeans did. 
and are now the dominant lineage in Western and Eastern Europe, but there still are some left. And if you do enough branches of your family tree, if you have European heritage, you probably will like find some link there eventually. They connect to a Middle Eastern group here or Middle Eastern and Central Asian, J1 and J2. Again, I'm going through this very quickly, but it's explained in much more detail in the book. And there's there it's mapped out for you. Again, that you can find these types of maps in the book. This seems to correlate fairly decently with a map of the Indo-European language family. This is also a map from the book. This is this map. It fits the mainstream history for the origin of the Indo-European peoples. All that's there. So spoil the surprise somewhat. I is likely the lineage of the some of the early Indo-Europeans. Whether or not it's the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, that's that's something that remains to be seen. But in the in this just the few minutes that I that I walked you through all this, I want you to see that this this big new discovery, one, one of the big new discoveries from creation science based research, is the history of peoples. When you start digging into this, you find some big surprises as as it relates here to the to the origin of modern Europeans. There are ancient peoples you can still find if they left enough descendants. And this is the type of thing we can do for basically every other people group on earth. Assuming they didn't get wiped out by subsequent conquest. You can take the DNA of modern people, work your way back in time. And that's essentially what most of this book traced does. You, we talk about the, the rise and fall of the Egyptians. Can we find their lineage in, in modern Egyptians? Can we find them elsewhere? Could, could you and I be descendants of the ancient Egyptians? What about the Persians and South Indians and Asians? And, and on and on the book goes all around the globe. And, and this type of analysis that I just did for the Romans, for the Jensen line, for the Ham line, uncovering this sort of history is something everyone can do. So if you get a Y chromosome test, and I, and I want to reiterate again, if you do DNA testing, it's very important that it's not just a generic DNA test. Most of these DNA tests that you are, are advertised, things like Ancestry.com, will advertise DNA from both parents. That won't take you back very far. You need the DNA just through dad, through a male line. That's the Y chromosome lineage. And if you happen to get a result you can't make sense of, or if you'd like to contribute to future research, because this is just the beginning of a, a likely a lifelong research endeavor, you can go to our website. This website will also be in the book as well in the appendix A, ancestorsgenesis.org slash go slash traced. You click on this little button there, Hidden History of Every People Project. It'll take you down to a, an information box or you just scroll down this page, enter your name, email address, the message. Let's say you're a missionary working with, with, a, with a neglected people group. Or let's say you've gotten a result that uh, is unusual. That might be one of these ancient peoples we haven't yet uncovered. I can tell you right now that the ancient Assyrians, the conquerors of the northern tribes of Israel, rulers of the Middle East for a brief period of time, who were eventually conquered by the Babylonians, who were conquered by the Persians, we know exactly from Genesis 10 which son of Shem they came from. We haven't yet detected that genetic line. So I have a feeling the lineage of the ancient Assyrians, in a sense, one of the lost peoples of the ancient world, is still out there. And their line, their echo might be in you, it might be in your family line. So this is one volume of human narrative, human origins, that this new research uncovers. We'll have about nine of these new volumes to uncover as this series goes along. Again, the book is out, selling quickly. It's connected to and fulfills predictions made in Replacing Darwin. I do have a simple version of Replacing Darwin called Replacing Darwin Made Simple. And if, if uh, you want to follow more of this work or you, you have questions that we didn't answer today, or you, let's say you read the book. I set up pages. I set up a page for Traced for the purpose of being able to engage in dialogue. My hope is this book goes far and wide, not just within the creationist community, but to, to the wider community as well. And this would be a place for people to discuss their stories, their questions about who humans came from, and that it would change the national narrative about human origins, what creation science has to do with all this, and change the national view of the scriptures, their veracity, their authority, and their relevance to our, to our daily lives and our history. So, um, Dr. Jensen, just as we finish up here, in the book, uh, you, for instance, have a page there where it has all those categories, uh, you know, the categories that are R1A, R1B, R2, now, if they get their DNA tested through a company that does a Y chromosome test, will it, will it use one of those same categories? Hopefully, yes. The Y chromosome result, let's say, for example, we got for, for your DNA test. Instead of saying R1B, they did R dash, and then it was like M269, some sort of generic marker for R1B. And so if someone gets a result like that, again, it, it changes from time to time because 
the DNA companies will change which markers they use. They'll change their pricing. That, that All that is hard to keep up with. There is a central database, though, where you can convert all that to names in the book. I tried to use names that are reported as much as possible. But again, there may be stuff that comes up. People can just go to the website, type in the question. We can get the result very fast for them. They will get the answer they need just by taking one of these Y chromosome tests. And if there's if there's some trouble with the readout, there's there's easy ways to, to solve that. Well, this is all uh, very, very fascinating. Now, for next week, you're going to particularly talk about uh, the uh, people here in, uh, in America, uh, the American and uh, Native Americans and their history. So you're going to have some fascinating insights into Native Americans, correct? Yes, uh, this is this is a an ar arena that was a big black box to me growing up, and I never thought I'd be discovering new events in Native American history as a result of this biblically grounded research that I've been doing for the past several years. So discovering new events, that's going to be very interesting. Okay, so uh, the name of the book is Traced, and a lot of people have been looking forward to this since your first series uh, that we did. Uh, Human DNA's big surprise, uh, Traced, cutting edge research. Nobody's ever done this before, and it's going to be fascinating, and I'm sure there's a lot more that's going to come from this. So we look forward to part three next week.